ages me a lot. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm actually delighted to be back at Emory. It's been about a decade since I came here to give a talk to the surge group uh, on this very topic. And actually, I, I gave a talk thinking, now we understand this pathway uh, pretty well. Um, and then the uh, subsequent decade, I realized we really didn't know that much at all. So uh, there's a lot of updates, basically, uh, to present today uh, on this particular pathway. Okay, so a little alphabet soup uh, for those who are not so biochemical genetics in the room. Um, basically, uh, all, all the enzymes that we're going to deal with have their abbreviations. NK, of course, is the most famous of all. And anything with an N in front of it, of course, stands for medium. So that's medium chain acetoic dehydrogenase, uh, which basically is an enzyme which works on fatty acid intermediates of uh, chain length C6 to C10. <laughs> VLCAD, unfortunately named, because LCAD got in first, and LCAD is not yet associated with human disease. Uh, because if you're able to go back to the literature, uh, looking at LCAD, uh, we'll appreciate eventually that every patient in the literature described with LCAD deficiency actually has VLCAD deficiency. Uh, a CPT is for expensive quantity pump or transferase. There are two of those, one and two. And we'll talk a little bit about one of these uh, CPT enzymes. Uh, the trifunctional protein is a multi-enzyme complex which actually has a whole bunch of different enzymes in it. A long chain enolcholate hydratase, the three hydroxy enolcholate dehydrogen is also known as l chair that's long chain, uh, and three ketal acylcholate thiolase, which is long chain thiolase. Again, these work on fatty acid intermediates between uh, 12 and 18 carbons. Uh, then the M slash S chain, which is medium and short chain, three hydroxy is a polyhydrogenase, which I will get to talk about in some detail later on, because that's uh, the enzyme of the day, the enzyme du jour. So our goals today, basically, are to describe uh, a background of MCAD deficiency. I have to do that because I wouldn't have a career without MCAD deficiency. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm uh, and, and, the, and the movement towards universal screening and how it actually proceeded. Uh, I'm going to talk, oops, me, talk a little bit about uh, some of the long chain defects and an unanticipated finding in one of them. And then finally, I'm going to talk about uh, the most recent disorder, which is the S chair deficiency, M such as chair deficiency. And it plays a novel role in insulin secretion by pancreas. And that's where uh, our future is going with this metabolic pathway. But first, being a fully paid up member of the metabolic disease biochemical genetic community, I have to show up. Uh, the union wouldn't allow me to be here. <laughs> and, and of course, everyone working in biochemical genetics believes that his pathway is the most important pathway that there is. Today, I'm actually going to show you the most important pathway that there is. <laughs> so, in, in this pathway, one chain fatty acid in the circulation have to essentially cross three different membranes in order to get into the mitochondrion to generate energy for uh, metabolic purposes. And they get through the mitochondrial membranes using the carnitine shuffle. It requires carnitine, the enzyme CPT1, uh, takes this activated fatty acid, acyl-CoA, converts it to an acyl carnitine, gets into the inner mitochondrial membrane area using this translocase enzyme, reconverted back to an acyl coa using CPT2, and then goes through the cycle of events. There are four different enzymes in the um, inner mitochondrial membrane, four different enzymes in the matrix. Now each step takes an acetyl coa group off, and ultimately you end up just with acetyl coa, which can make ketone bodies in the liver, make steroids and tissues, can be directly utilized as energy in tissues such as muscle and heart. And the ultimate goal is to actually get ATP from this pathway. Um, a couple of, couple of points from, from this. Those of you who treat patients with medium chain triglycerides, for instance, uh, these are the medium chain fatty acids, actually get into the mitochondrion by some other mechanism. It doesn't require the carnitine shuffle, it's more efficient. And that's in fact why uh, medium chain triglycerides are rather effective at generating. Uh, energy for infants or failing to thrive, for instance. Uh, this is a bidirectional transporter, the translocase. Uh, 
physiologically, acyclicality comes in and then free carnitine goes out again for recycling purposes. But uh, in a pathological situation where there's a defect of any one of these enzymes here of phagosyloxidation, uh, the acyl carnitines that are formed by reverse reaction of the CP2 can also be excreted. That's the basis of acyl carnitines in the circulation that we monitor newborns, basically. And then the other point I've made here, we actually <coughs> cartoon this as a multi-enzyme complex. Now, uh, at the time we did this slide, which is, gosh, 10 years ago, uh, we didn't know that for sure, we don't know that for sure now, but it, it made sense to us that it ought to be some sort of complex, uh, because this is a pathway which switches on very quickly when you're fasting. There's a huge flux to the fatty acid oxidation pathway, and it makes sense if there's organization. Uh, but no one had actually ever shown organization of any of these enzymes. But I will show you some evidence to say that this is actually true. So, the components of uh, mitochondrial fatty acid oxidation is the fatty acid transport, that's the movement of fatty acids and carnitine from the circulation to the outer mitochondrial membrane. The carnitine cycle, which is activation, entry of fatty acids or coase in the mitochondria, this actually controls the flux in the pathway, because if you can't get into the mitochondria, you can't be oxidized. And then there's a process of beta oxidation at the inner mitochondrial membrane, the long chain basal coase accumulate and they're oxidized. And then in the matrix, uh, this magnificent alphabet soup, uh, the medium and short chain intermediates are oxidized. Now the carnitine cycle, as I say, is the rate limiting step uh, for translocation into the mitochondria. It's actually inhibited by malonyl-CoA. Uh, tissue levels of malonyl-CoA rise when you're postprandial. You're eating carbohydrates. One of the products of metabolism of those carbohydrates is malonyl-CoA. Malonyl-CoA will inhibit CPT1 activity. You can't make acyl carnitines, and so there's no flux through the pathway. When you're fasting, the tissue levels of malonyl-CoA go down, uh, so this inhibition of CPT1 is relieved and uh, you can then sort of get fatty acids into the mitochondria to generate energy. <clears throat> uh, and, and that's another important when we're thinking about uh, a defect I'll talk about in a little while. Uh, it also introduces the first concept of tissue specificity for this pathway because there are a whole bunch of different cpt ones the first enzyme which controls this rate. There's one that's present in the liver, kidney, and fortunately for us it's actually the one that we measure in skin fibroblasts. So when you're looking for a diagnosis of CPT1 deficiency in fibroblasts, that's the one we can do, it. it's called CPT1A. Uh, CPT1B is present in cardiac and skeletal muscle. The genetic defect awaits us. It's out there somewhere. Uh, but we have not found a genetic defect of this. Uh, the late Dennis Bigari thought this might be incompatible with life because the heart needs it. But in fact, in a newborn, there's a, there's a mixture of CPT1A and CPT1B uh, expressed, and it's possible that it's not totally incompatible with life, which is might be a very severe disorder. And then very recently, a, a brain form of the enzyme, which is probably somehow related to uh, uh, feeding uh, needs. Uh, we don't know for sure what its function is, but it is probably related to satiety, uh, has been identified. Um, CPT, the carnitine translocase, translocase is a bidirectional translocator, takes the uh, acyl carnitines into the mitochondria, and then CPT2 converts the acyl carnitine to a acyl CoA and for oxidation. And then you remember acyl CoAs cannot get out of the mitochondria. So in, in kids with metabolic defects here, where they accumulate intracellular levels of acyl CoAs of wherever the block is, they cannot move. Uh, and then you would sequester all of your CoA uh, in an acute situation if you couldn't get rid of it in, in any way at all. So at the in the mitochondrial membrane, we have CPG2 remaking the acyl CoA, DL CAD, and the trifunctional protein, and they're integral. And then there's, now there's, there's some evidence from uh, Dr. Jerry Volkley's lab that these are actually formed as a complex as well. Um, there's some starting to be increasing evidence. So I, I think in the past what we've done, we've taken mitochondria, beat the heck out of them. Uh, by the way, we isolate uh, these proteins and basically probably broken up any complex that might have been present. Uh, and uh, certainly at some point, and we don't know quite where, uh, the substrate channels to the matrix enzymes, so the short and medium chain enzymes, take over at some point. 
Um, uh, but we don't know. Uh, so the nice thing about this pathway is going to keep me going for much, much longer because there's so many questions that we can still ask, basically. But we don't know what uh, causes the substrate to move from these long chain enzymes of membrane to the matrix enzymes. And then in the matrix, we have NCAP, we have SCAP. Uh, I'm not going to talk about SCAP deficiency. I, I now believe that it isn't a real disease. And that in the past, we, <laughs> in the past we had association, but it was not true, true related, basically. Uh, we have an awful lot of kids who are diagnosed in the newborn period with SCAP deficiency who have never been sick. Uh, certainly, they have never been sick like the kids who were initially prescribed. And I have to confess, we actually published one of the original cases, so uh, yeah, this, is a, this is a step backwards. Uh, there's a short chain hydrotase for which no defect has been found. But in fact, there are a lot of hydrotases on the cell. It may well be that this is redundant to protein. And an s chat we'll talk about that. And then the short chain ketoase and polythiolase is actually also known as beta ketothiolase, part of the uh, branch chain amino acid pathway. And it's a well known defect which we won't talk about again today. So the genetic defects of fat oxidation, they are uh, classically disorders of fasting intolerance and the failure to respond to those increased energy demands. Uh, they tend to have intermittent clinical presentations, which is why it took us a while to get there, basically. Uh, we have failure of hepatic ketogenesis, so the liver can't make ketone bodies, one of the end products. So you get hypoketotic hypoglycemia associated with these diseases. Uh, we have a dry like hepatic encephalopathy. So basically, what happens in this disease is that the fat is channeled to the liver, it can't be metabolized, uh, the fat accumulates in the liver and develops this dry like illness, which hopefully none of us will never see again. Uh, but in, in, in its form, it can actually uh, cause basically death to a liver failure. Uh, there's a failure to respond to increasing muscular energy demands. That can lead to rhabdomyolysis and cardiomyopathy cardinal features of some of the long chain defects in particular. Uh, we tend to forget about this, but these enzymes are expressed in kidney as well, and will result in uh, renal tubular acidosis. And if unrecognized, uh, particularly in the old days, uh, it can be fatal. Uh, the onset of hypoglycemia can be incredibly rapid in these diseases in the acute phase, and actually cause death very, very quickly. In fact, I spent a good bit of my early life working with the medical examiners investigating kids who died, who had some of the cardiovascular uh, signs and sort of clues. So MCAT deficiency was first postulated by uh, a Danish colleague of mine, Dr. Niels Gregersen, uh, doing primitive metabolomics. This is one of the, of the phrases now, metabolomics. Well, he, he was looking for metabolites, which is what metabolomics is all about. And to him, it's uh, a metabolomic pattern that we saw in these children suggested the possibility of this enzyme. But the enzyme didn't exist at that time, it just suggested that there might be a medium chain enzyme that serves this function. Uh, and so in the early 80s, a group at CHOP uh, and my group in Sheffield actually developed enzymes for this theoretical enzyme, the assays for this theoretical enzyme. And, and in fact, CHOP beat us because being British, we we you know, took some time out for tea. <laughs> and these, guys, these guys at CHOP were very competitive and they went straight to publishing a rapidly publishing journal as well. We waited for the British Medical Journal for us. Uh, we also take tea. And so those guys uh, published uh, a case which had Rice syndrome, which is about liver failure. We actually subsequently identified the first case, previously classified as SIDS at the time. And this was the sort of onset of NCAP deficiency. Then the word started to get out in the 1980s. Um, throughout then, there were lots of cases described associated with sudden death, often hypoglycemia, liver failure. Uh, and it came from neonates to adults. And the oldest case in the literature is a 46 year old lady who was having some, uh, I would say, elective, some gastric surgery. She was fasted before the surgery, she was NPO after the surgery and developed a rye-like illness, hypoglycemia, hepatic encephalopathy, and died uh, post-surgery. And uh, subsequently was shown to be homozygous for the common NCAD mutation. Uh, which sort of tells us something uh, to think about. Uh, there are people walking around out there with NCAD deficiency who have yet to be 
uh, identified, and they're all at risk. Uh, you know, we tend to think, okay, we're going to grow out of this to some extent, but in this type of scenario, uh, there's a risk still. Uh, it was estimated that 25% of cases actually died at first presentation uh, of this disease. There's a high morbidity in survivors because they're getting these profound hypoglycemias, and so they have neurological damage. Uh, very high incidence of previous sibling deaths in those families. And we estimated this, uh, the frequency of this disease just from case <coughs> assessment to be sort of similar to that of PKU, which everyone was screening for at that time. And we had a common mutation. And also, by now, it's regarded that if we diagnose this early enough, it will be treated. And that becomes a sort of a significant component to thinking about a newborn screening program. So, uh, in the year 2000, this was the status of newborn screening or NCAD deficiency in the United States. And I actually thank uh, Piero Ronaldo for some of these slides. And anyone who's met Piero uh, will know that he needs to be thanked for this work. Uh, okay, so nobody was being screened for the NCAD deficiency at this point in time. Um, as in any sort of change, there are a few uh, initiators of programs. And two years later, you've got us in Wisconsin, which is North Carolina. What they're doing, they're, they're, they're actually starting to use tandem mass spectrometry for screening uh, as programs. Uh, for this. So it's not just looking at NCAD deficiency, but now it's because of the number of conditions they were screening for in these two states. Everyone else is still clustered over this side with the traditional newborn screen. Things move very quickly though. So two years later, you can see now that there is a shift in this direction. Uh, but there's no guidance. This is about the time that the American College of Medical Genetics actually started to think about should we be screening for these diseases? And yet all of these states now are actually screening for many, many. Yeah, so they commissioned a report, which came out in 2006 which recognized that there was a core group of 29 conditions to be screened for as the primary targets. About 20 of these could be identified by tandem mass spectrometry. The additional group of 25 conditions as <coughs> secondary targets, 22 of which could be diagnosed by tandem mass spectrometry. And of course it includes all of, all of my diseases, all of the known fatty acid oxidation disorders were on this list. And so by about now, 98% plus of all babies born in the US a screen for NCAD deficiency and a bunch of other conditions as well, most of the foundation defects. So that, that actually, to me, that's rather remarkable. Within a decade, uh, without a lot of impetus from government or uh, the, you know, the esteemed party, uh, things moved and, and happened. And we know the situation today. So does screen for NCAD deficiency actually work? Um, uh, there were no outcome studies to say this was going to be actually any good when we, uh, we all moved over to that. And this is a very nice study out of Australia. Uh, Dr. Bridget Wilkin in Australia sort of has a centralized program where everyone in Australia is now screened. And this is some of her sort of outcomes data. So pre-screening, uh, she evaluated 1.6 million births in the entire country of Australia, identified 28 cases of MCAD deficiency of which 22 either resulted in death or a severe hypoglycemic thing. So, you know, really, when it was in a bad disease to have, basically. Uh, Post-screening, half as many births, twice as many cases. And in fact, there were two, well, there was one death and one severe episode in this. And the death came in the perinatal period before a screen could be actually gotten back from the screen line. So, yeah, I think it looks pretty good that the outcomes are great. And I can say that child care are about 30 cases that have been screened for NCAD deficiency. None of them have had an acute episode. They're, 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 they're all doing very well. So I think outcomes for NCAD deficiency are really good. And now we're starting to see some outcomes from the, some of the rare conditions, the rare fat oxidation defects. And, and intuitively, we think they're doing better, but we don't yet have enough data to say, yes, it's working across the board. Uh, so, and there's, there's, sorry, that's the, the child cases. So basically what it means though, is that pediatricians won't get to see acute presentations of any type of deficiency. You won't get to see Rouse syndrome anymore. Kids are not given salicylates, which was also a sort of, uh, a sort of an indicator of Rouse syndrome. Uh, the ones who were not salicylate induced probably had any type of deficiency. So uh, pediatricians, geneticists, and hopefully are never gonna see an acute episode of any type of deficiency again. Uh, pediatric pathologists will see less of this. That's what the liver looks like in MCAD deficiency when uh, uh, it's pointed that this is taking an autopsy. That's fat. 
that's the job we're talking about. And, uh, plus, there will be lots of other reasons for them to see how they live uh, in the future with our epidemic of obesity. Uh, so now, uh, treated iron carb deficiency, it's not such a bad disease to have. Uh, in fact, if, if I were to have a high chemical genetic disease, I, I'd, I'd go for iron carb deficiency. <laughs> 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 it's far worse ones, I think. So it's gone from a fatal condition to almost 100% survival in, uh, in a couple of decades, basically. Uh, these kids are normal. Uh, I was actually at a family support group meeting a couple of years ago, uh, and there was this young man playing the piano uh, for everyone. And he was actually, it was in the UK, he was about to be going to the equivalent of Juilliard in London. And I thought he was a sibling. I said, no, Dr. Bennett, you, you diagnosed me a long time ago in, in the UK. <coughs> and they're all doing really, really well, these, these kids. Uh, but the precautions you've always got to prevent that prolonged fasting. Surgery is a contraindication for this disease. Maybe, I don't know uh, about marathon running, that's probably not a good thing to do either. Which now brings us to CPT1A deficiency, which is one of the long chain defects. So, it's, so far, it's the only form of CPT deficiency described to date. It's the liver one, the one that we can diagnose for you in skin fibroblasts. Oops. Uh, results in fasting induced hypoketotic hypoglycemia. Now, being a long chain defect, you will get absolutely no ketones made because you can't get any of those acetylbutyl stuff. Whereas an MCAT deficiency, you can get a positive acid test, by the way. Uh, you dip a stick in a urine from someone acutely ill with MCAT deficiency, it will be positive. Uh, and again, it, it's somewhat that this tip you want to do a similar clinical presentation to MCAT, hepatic disease, where well, like that's rare. Uh, the literature only has 30 or 40 cases so far. Uh, and uh, many of these are homozygous for private mutations, uh, suggesting there's some degree of consanguinity. Uh, and all, almost all of them have actually zero activity. And we measure the enzyme activity in skin fibroblasts. There's nothing much to measure. There's no obvious genotype phenotype correlation for these particular cases. And then uh, we have one odd, odd one, which is P47L mutation, which we identify in an adult native Canadian, and it has 20% residual activity. And in fact, it loses that malonyl-CoA inhibition site as a result of the mutation. And we just thought it was an odd one. In fact, we thought the whole thing was wrong. This, this, this individual had myopathy. Uh, the lab in Vancouver centers the sample thinking it might be CPT2 deficiency. But CPT2 deficiency is the commonest cause of metabolic myopathy. Uh, and so they're actually asking us to measure CPT2, but we actually do CPT1 and CPT2 simultaneously. The enzyme assay does both. And it turned out to be CPT1 deficient and we found the mutations. Uh, so we took it back to our colleagues in Vancouver. They decided that the myopathy might be related to the fact that this guy was distilling things in the woods out in Vancouver that, <laughs> and whatever he distilled and probably had nothing to do with CPT deficiency at all. So we left this one in the literature for a while. And then they started newborn screening in Alaska. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's the lab in Oregon who actually screens for the Alaskan population. And all of a sudden they started getting all these positive screens for CPT1 deficiency. And uh, we were doing the enzymology, and we were getting 20% residual activity. Basically. So we thought, well, I wonder if they've got this particular mutation in this, pop in this population. We're calling it a mutation still at this point. And so we actually set up a simple screen for the mutation. And we took fibroblasts from the Alaskan <coughs> kids who were positive for this, all of whom were Inuit. They were all actually um, Eskimo origin. And Lo and behold, every single one of them is homozygous for this particular change. And I think now the Oregon lab has got hundreds and hundreds of cases of individuals who are homozygous for this particular uh, DNA variant, as we're calling it now. Uh, Cross-sectional studies have not been done in the population yet, so we don't, we don't know whether this is just a normal variant for inuits, but we think it probably is. Actually, and the kinds of anyone who's had trouble dealing with an IRB. <laughs> <laughs> anyone who's had to deal with an IRB has had trouble, I can tell you now. I just sit on an IRB. 
Uh, tribal councils are much worse to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and unfortunately, someone mentioned genetics, and uh, the Inuit population didn't like these people doing genetic research on them. And my colleagues in Oregon go every summer because you've got a very short season to visit uh, in Alaska to try to explain to the tribal council that we're all, we're talking about genetics. This is basically, we're trying to do a study to see whether this is normal, and we've actually some cross-sectional studies in the population. Can we have a blood sample, please? Uh, this has been four years in the making so far. They've been going every summer. They're girding themselves for another trip, I'm sure, this year. Uh, so where we are with the situation at the moment, so we have this, this is the variant. Uh, it's also present in some of the First Nations tribes in, in Canada. And that should have some published information from those guys. It's actually present also in the native Greenland population. Uh, what's interesting though is that the rate of SIDS is three times higher than the North American population, and maybe other reasons for, for that. Uh, there's certainly increasing obesity in the population, and maybe other reasons for that. Uh, we, we know that this enzyme here, decreased enzyme activity, and uh, lacks inhibition by melanin CoA. So, uh, the fatty acids are continuously being able to get into the mitochondria for oxidative purposes. There's nothing to stop them getting in. The enzyme works at a lower rate, but uh, it, it doesn't actually uh, switch off when you're fed. So we think it actually could well be an adaptive, an, an, an advantageous uh, uh, change to the aging <coughs> lifestyle. So summertime, things looking good, you've caught a seal, you're going to eat that seal, you're going to put some weight on. Uh, winter time, your seals have gone, uh, but now you can actually sit in your igloo and basically live off that seal slowly, almost like hibernation. You've got uncontrolled but consistent and constant uh, oxidative uh, uh, metabolism of, of lipids. So we think it actually could well be an adaptive lifestyle for ancient Inuit uh, stars. What would be worried? Worrying, I should say, is that um, I've been in Anchorage recently. They have McDonald's there. They've got all the <laughs> And uh, the Western lifestyle might actually not be good, uh, given this particular uh, DNA variant. And it may be a cause of uh, the higher infant death. It may be a cause of the obesity that we're seeing in the adult populations. So, but again, we need to do those cross-sectional studies. Um, alternatives are to maybe study other individuals who have a sort of similar lifestyle. I thought maybe that would be a good idea. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I wouldn't want to be the one to volunteer to draw blood on him. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's there. So well, this is a story that's in the making and we'll, we'll see how, how it progresses and maybe we'll get the tribal councils to approve to those cross-sectional studies. It would be good to know if the infants are going to be so I guess it would be good to know if uh, any other sort of uh, disadvantageous um, life patterns were associated with this change. So other long chain uh, fatty acid oxidation defects include the CBT2 deficiency, the translocase and the LCAD deficiency. And each of these has three different clinical phenotypes. Uh, we've got the, oops. We have the fatal neonatal phenotype, the very severe mutation, usually due to uh, truncating mutations, or mutations where there's no protein generated at all. Uh, and so that's generally has systemic disease, including some developmental issues with the severe CBT2 form. Uh, there's an infantile form of the disease, which usually has severe fasting intolerance, often myopathy and cardiomyopathy. These individuals do have a sort of, a sort of genotype phenotype correlation that in that they tend to be compound heterozygotes for one of the severe, very fatal uh, neonatal forms and one of the milder forms of the disease. And then there's the adult onset with myopathy, but no cardiac and hepatic disease. Now what's interesting for CBT2 deficiency, there's a common mutation in adult presentation. Uh, it's the S113L mutation. And uh, what happens, this is actually is a heat labile protein. And so you can make the protein, it has 20, 30, 40% residual activity. Uh, uh, but when, for instance, you're doing uh, exercise of any kind and the muscle warms up, the protein falls to pieces. And so you tend to see this myopathic presentation for the disease. 
The liver doesn't warm up in the same way, so the, the residual activity is fine in the liver. These individuals can make ketone bodies. Uh, so that, that, all that is fine. Uh, and we actually see this disease, the adult form of CT2 deficiency, for instance, in young men who join the arm go to boot camp for the first time. Uh, we've had uh, SWAT squad members identified with this disease suddenly develop potentially fatal rhabdomyolysis, basically. And uh, this is undoubtedly the most common metabolic myopathy. Uh, trifunctional protein deficiency, this is that sort of multi-enzyme complex. It's a little different. Uh, this is actually a heterooctone, so there's eight subunits, four alpha, four beta subunits. The alpha subunit contains a hydratase and the LCHAD deficiency. The beta subunit contains the thiolase enzyme. Uh, if there's basically, uh, we define LCHAP deficiency, we started in, in, in 1989 from, from Wonders in Amsterdam, uh, as a mutation that only affects the LCHAP activity. And there's this very common mutation, G1528C, uh, in 60% of all alleles, 100% uh, in Finland. Uh, and this basically just affects the uh, cofactor binding site for LCHAP, it doesn't affect the other constituents at all. And uh, so you see LCHAD deficiency, but you don't see the hydratase, you don't see the thiolase deficiency. Complete trifunctional protein defects can result from mutation in either subunit, which affects all, uh, all of the enzyme activities. And the clinical features include the viral illness, include the pipe failure, the hypoketotic hypoglycemia. There's a more chronic liver disease associated with LCHAD deficiency. So anyone who's Managing individuals with this defect will probably be seeing much more chronic liver disease. It goes on, it's not just like the acute events associated with fasting. And it can lead to such a cirrhosis. The individuals will develop cardiomyopathy, uh, muscle weakness, uh, and at uh, risk for a very, very rapid onset of rhabdomyolysis with trifunctional protein defects. It's not a good disease to have. Uh, there are some peripheral neuropathy. And then this sort of retinal pigmentary changes. These kids go blind, basically. Uh, and, and we think this related to the fact that we get some very unusual fatty acids accumulating in the system. These are three hydroxylated fatty acids. And we think it may well be that there's some sort of detergent effect of these fatty acids on membranes, which cause the additional problems with the health deficiency. And then uh, there's this obstetric complication of health deficiency. Uh, to acute fatty liver of pregnancy, which is basically mom's a heterozygote carrying a homozygously affected fetus. And it's mom who gets sick, basically. Uh, and uh, this, this, again, this is, this is something to strike fear into obstetricians as a, as a clinical condition. It's a horrible condition, often associated with uh, both maternal and fetal death, if not treated. Uh, and we think it's actually related to the fact that uh, the, the percent, of course, is fetal material. That's homozygously affected, and, and, and in some way the placental metabolism is implicated uh, in this acute fatty liver pregnancy complication. Now, LCHAD deficiency does not cause acute fatty liver of pregnancy. Uh, we thought that this might be a, a, a reason to explain the whole process, but when you do a prospective study of acute fatty liver of pregnancy with an obstetrician, uh, you don't see a lot of LCHAD deficiency. The converse is true, though, that <coughs> LCHAD deficiency is associated fatty liver pregnancy. It might actually be giving us some clues to the pathophysiology of the process, but uh, not everyone with acute fatty liver has an LCHAP deficiency. And now, to my new favorite enzyme, uh, and we call it, most people would call it S-CHAP deficiency. I, I actually prefer to call it M slash S-CHAP because actually the chain length specificity of the enzyme is anywhere from C6 to C12. Uh, and although we only measure C4 uh, function, it can make it operate the C4, but it, 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 it's more specific at the medium chain. So it's a very rare disease at the moment. The literature has six cases in five families who have actually got mutation in the right gene. There are some cases that there are no mutations. We know of maybe another half dozen cases uh, and actually seem to be fairly common in Portugal for some reason. Go figure. Um, so five of these cases, of the six cases, are clinically associated with dioxide responsive hypoglycemia and hyperinsulinism. None of the other fatty acid oxidation defects have got 
an association with hyperinsulinism. So this is this is different in some way. Uh, the metabolic abnormalities that we know of include elevated C4 hydroxylase and carnitine. Um, one of the Portuguese cases was picked up by newborn screening with this particular species elevated, but it's not like 10 times normal. It's like three times normal. And anyone who's fasting has got an elevated C4 hydroxylase or carnitine. So there's a sort of specificity issue going on here. We see, uh, if we were to measure the 3 hydroxy fatty acids in serum, we see elevated C6 and C8 3 hydroxy fatty acids. Um, but not the acyl carnitines. There, there's, there's some old literature which suggests that uh, the medium chain 3 hydroxy species are not good substrates for carnitine synthesis. And for, again, for reasons that we don't know, we see elevated urinary 3 hydroxy glutaric acid, a biomarker that we only ever see in glutaric acid in type 1 otherwise. But we see it in this disease and it's a relatively small number of cases. So why hyperinsulinism? Um, as I say, other fatty acid oxidation defects don't have this association. Uh, and how does this defect relate to other known genetic hyperinsulinism syndromes? So we, we know a fair bit about hyperinsulinism. And actually, it's it really great for me to go back to CHOP uh, five, six years ago, because the biggest hyperinsulinism clinic uh, in the US uh, is there with Dr. Charles Stanley, one of my good friends and colleagues. So we had a really good sort of uh, ground to work on there. And I'd like to thank him for this particular slide as well. So, uh, insulin release basically is generated through uh, ATP production from glucose. And this is the glucocarinase enzyme uh, that there's the transporter uh, through glucose phosphate, that's ATP. ATP closes this potassium channel here. Uh, depolarizes the membrane, opens this calcium channel, the influx of calcium causes insulin to be secreted. Uh, also, amino acids can cause insulin secretion. So, amino acids here, it's um, primarily glutamine here, converted to glutamate, through the action of glutamate dehydrogenase, also generates ATP and drives the same pathway. So, uh, what was known uh, 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 as we got into this field was that uh, gain of function mutations in glucokinase would cause more ATP to be produced and depolarize and cause more insulin to be released. Gain of function mutations in glutamate dehydrogenase will also uh, cause more ATP to be produced and pass through this cycle. Uh, loss of function mutations in any aspect of the uh, potassium channel will also cause this depolarization uh, and uh, it's going to be secreted. We have no idea what s chat was at this point. Uh, and uh, we know that diazoxide, because I've mentioned that these cases of s chat deficiency are diazoxide responsive, will actually uh, have a, a positive effect on this channel here. A negative effect, sorry, a negative effect. And so I'll my words on this part of the pathway. So the question was, well, what's, what's s chat doing here? We have a, a, a knockout method <coughs> where there are five or six patients. You can't actually study pancreas in people very easily, quite frankly. Uh, the IRB, I sit on one of the do this. Um, so we have a knockout nurse model for this. And it turns out to be it's a pretty good model, uh, as far as we can tell. Uh, oops, it has all the right. Metabolites, so we, we see uh, 3-hydroxy C4 carnitine. This is the knockout mouse level. This is the wild type. You can see the differences are not huge, and that's also true in people. That's when fed. Interestingly enough, uh, the same metabolite when fasted is higher in the wild type, and you would anticipate it to be higher because you're hopefully you're, you're, you're moving towards ketogenesis when fasted. But in fact, it's a little lower in the knockout mouse. There's a clue there as to what's going on here. Uh, the three hydroxy fatty acids uh, are elevated in our mouse compared to wild types, C6 and C8, just as in people. The urine organic acids has three hydroxy glutarate and glutaconic acid, which has not been seen in people. So we have the same biomarkers for the disease. So 
it appears somehow that SGI is modulating glutamate dehydrogenase activity. And the question was, is it a protein-protein interaction that's enzymatic? Is my enzyme doing something to glutamate dehydrogenase? Is it a non-enzymatic protein-protein interaction? What we call a moonlighting effect of the protein. It's not, there's no, nothing to do with fatty acid oxidation. It's just the protein itself is interacting with something. <coughs> Or is a regulation by a fatty acid metabolic intermediate? Well, we have searched high and low for reasons that any of those metabolic intermediates might uh, have an effect. We've actually developed an, an assay to measure intracellular acyl-CoAs. And we really haven't found a metabolite that we think is actually causing this change. So uh, this is actually not a very pretty slide, but it's the only one we've got. Uh, so when you don't pull down uh, of tagged s -gen. basically that's a histamine tagged s -gen on a column, then does it pull down other proteins? And it actually pulls down to make dehydrogenase. Yes, the proteins interact with each other. Basically, that's what it's telling us on that particular slide. This was actually done by uh, some friends who were in Stockholm at the time, showing a tower, but now I think they're in London. So, in thinking about possible protein-protein interactions, this is actually uh, an in silico experiment. This is the s chat dimer. So the X-ray crystal is known for this particular protein. This is the glutamate dehydrogenase trimer. So we ask the question, are these two likely to interact in any way whatsoever? Does the hydrostatic forces allow them to actually combine in some way? And when you just ask that in silico, you get that. Yes, my protein wraps around the glutamate dehydrogenase. SGI protein in silico actually wraps around. And it actually wraps around and sort of hides the NAD binding sites for glutamate dehydrogenase. So yeah, there could be a, a, a positive interaction here. So then we took our knockout mouse again, again using SGI as a bait, uh, and then this is the Western block for glutamate dehydrogenase. Uh, in the wild type, See, there's nothing there. So in the knockout, we see that there's actually a band of glutamate dehydrogenase. What it's telling us is that yes, the um, S chat pulls down glutamate dehydrogenase in the knockout, but not in the wild type. Uh, and, and I think that's telling us that in the wild type situation, uh, glutamate dehydrogenase is fully bound to S chat anyway, so none of it is free. And in fact, quantitatively, there's a, a lot of S chat is most abundant in pancreatic islands, for instance. So we think that's what that's telling us, is that uh, in, in, a, in a situation where there's a normal amount of s chat there's no good on dehydrogen is free. Everything is bound up to GDH. But in the knockout, of course, GDH is free, and it's free to be bound to R8, basically. So yes, there's a true protein-protein interaction going on here. Uh, in fact, the mass spectrometry of that band, because you can't just do Westerns anymore now, these are actually fragments from glutamate dehydrogenase that we actually pulled down uh, using that spec. So, okay, so glutamate dehydrogenase is the amino acid stimulated pathway for insulin secretion. This is actually isolated uh, pancreatic islets from the mice and by the channel loop. Uh, basically, what we're doing here is looking at the glutamine oxidation rate in that. So, glutamine to glutamate to alpha ketoglutarate to generate ATP, basically. And you can see that in the knockout mouse, there's twice as much glutamine oxidation going on. So it's a glutamine, the glutaminergic pathway of insulin secretion is upregulated. Moreover, we also did sort of amino acid mixes, make sure that other amino acids were all well not involved. And, uh, and essentially, in a situation where you remove all amino acids from this uh, isolated islets from the SGL knockout mass that does no stimulation of insulin. When you add amino acids back in again, with glutamine, glutamine reducing, glutamine alanine reducing, you see that we actually get stimulation of insulin. So this is basically telling us that this is probably got absolutely nothing to do with fatty acid oxidation. Um, and my uni won't allow me to say that ever. Um, <laughs> but, it probably is an amino acid stimulated process. 
Uh, and this is sort of bound out now by a little bit of clinical evidence, in fact, to say this is not a fasting disease. This is actually a postprandial disease. It's amino acid mixes that's actually causing the hyperinsulinism. So in fact, we actually also uh, took uh, molar mixtures of the two enzymes to see whether we could see a physical effect on, on, on the difference. And uh, so this is the S-chart GDH molar ratio. These are the kinetics of, of, of GDH. A little bit of S-chart, no change. Mm -hmm. The equimolar S-chart GDH mixture, no change. Then you've got three times the amount of S-chart to GDH, which approximates to the tissue levels, the islet tissue levels of, of these enzymes. You can see now the KM has gone up, basically. So under normal physiological conditions, the KM is higher for GDH, which proves essentially that it is actually regulating the GDH activity. So it's a non-fatty acid oxidation role for s -chair. Uh, so and we're, we're thinking now, now this is not an enzymatic protein protein interaction, it's a non-enzymatic with regards to S-chair, possible moonlighting or moon the protein. And then we have a clue from the one patient who I, I didn't actually explain in great detail, it was non-hyperinsulinemic. That's just the one in the literature. Um, these are the mutations in the picture. This, you know, this is the S-chart diagram. And um, there's a mutation here. So there's a compound epizagio. So this mutation here, which actually initially we thought would affect the dimerization of the protein, which I can show it doesn't. And then there's this mutation here, which is actually in the NAD binding site for s -chart. So we did a lot of studies. We expressed these two mutations. And first of all, this is a non denaturing gel, so it's not very pretty, but it, what it's telling us is that the, the native protein is there. So, so we thought that dimerization might be affected by one mutation, but it isn't. So it dimerizes, and this is the right size for a dimer. Uh, both of the monomers are present uh, and, and, and expressed. <coughs> uh, the kinetics do change. Again, this, the KM is affected for this protein, but the protein is there. And that's the important point of this. It's a kinetic mutation that causes the disease in this patient, but in fact the protein is present and presumably is interacting normally with glutamate dehydrogenase. Uh, this patient is not getting hyperinsulinase. Again, some evidence to say that it's, it's a protein-protein interaction. So, uh, so the patients with no mutations demonstrate hyperinsulinism. The patient with reduced activity with normal protein expression doesn't demonstrate hyperinsulinism. So the loss of s chat protein upregulates GDH activity in a fashion similar to the gain of function mutations in glutamate dehydrogenase. Uh, so it's a protein sensitivity rather than a fasting defect. We're still searching for possible medical intermediates. That's what I do for a living. I've got to find something at some point. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll keep on searching. I've got to in case at the moment. Uh, and then the question then comes, does GDH or another interacting protein have a regulatory role for s chat it working both ways. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, then that pull down experiment, I only showed you a part of the data. Uh, lots of other proteins pulled down in the same you know, pull down experiment. Uh, and in fact, it provides a lot of very firm evidence for the convergence of multiple metabolic pathways. So in the same pull down, we have glutamate dehydrogenase, we have carbonyl phosphate synthase 1 which is an enzyme of urogenesis, mm -hmm. uh, requires for a cofactor a compound called N-acetyl glutamate. Okay, so it's competing for glutamate in the pool. HMG CoA synthase and lyase, two enzymes of ketogenesis, are part of this what is pulled down, this is the immunopulled pull down. Uh, and this is in liver, of course, you wouldn't expect that in other tissues. Uh, we pulled down the mitochondrial trifunctional protein, both alpha and beta subunits. Uh, this is the first clue that based the long chain and the medium and short chain enzymes are somehow connected metabolically. We pulled down the spartate amino transferase, otherwise known as glutamate oxaloacetate transferase. This is another enzyme where you're competing for glutamate, and you're making glutamate available for glutamate dehydrogenase reaction. Uh, malate dehydrogenase, part of the malate shuttle, shuttle and oxaloacetate in and out of the mitochondrion. 
the three, we were very happy to see this one, so the three keto isoprophyllides, the short chain thyroids, beta keto thyroids, that also pulled down, because that's the next enzyme in the fatty acid oxidation pathway. <laughs> this is a two-fold amino reductase for branch chain, no, oh, sorry, for branch chain, for unsaturated fatty acid oxidation, uh, pulled down as well. And then we have multiple subunits of complex one and five of oxidative phosphorylation. This is where those electrons are going eventually. What we actually think we have now is a metabolic mega complex. We pull down lots and lots of tissue, uh, there are pathways which are competing. Um, and again, sadly for a fatty acid oxidation sort of person, we think at the center of this world is an amino acid. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so the glutamate is basically uh, central to all, everything that's going on here. All those pathways either require glutamate, they're competing for it. Uh, in some way, uh, and, and, and between uh, its various channels of, of metabolic direction, uh, this glutamate pool is, is absolutely critical for uh, all the pathways up to an effectiveness of oxidation, ketogenesis, uh, ureogenesis, and the liver. We're actually just pulled down, uh, use the same experiment in different tissues. We've just done the experiment. None of this is published work at the moment. Uh, in uh, liver fasted and non fasted to see whether there's a difference. Muscle, brain, lots and lots of different tissues, and we're actually waiting for the mass spec uh, lab to come up with some, 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 some data to show that this may happen in other tissues. Can we pause for one moment? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you're going to love this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anybody's ever been on a cruise watching a football match. <laughs> because when, when you see a football match on a cruise, you don't get the adverts. And when you get everybody standing around waiting for the adverts to start. <laughs> I sort of felt a little bit like that at the time. The reason you didn't look is it's my last slide. measured S-chat activity in all the patients who have not been characterized, and there's a cohort who have incredibly low activity but no mutations in the S-chat gene. So we've, we're actually hoping, as we do all these pull-down experiments, we're going to get candidate disorders of proteins that are regulating S-chat in that particular fashion. Actually, we also have one patient who's got S-chat activity that's like 10 times normal in the same group, only one of them, but has a hyperinsulinism phenotype, so it's sort of, you know, it's, this, it's a very good from the pond to be fishing at the moment for genetic diseases. Uh, in my lab, Shrinivas uh, Narayan and Luke Tad have been doing the pull down experiments, there are 4,000 cases as well. And Arnie Strauss in Cincinnati and Murray Russell in, uh, in St. Louis generated an account mouse which they very kindly gave to us. We were maintaining and giving some interesting answers. And my, my guess is that in another decade, I could come back and give you a completely different story. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to thank you for your attention. Happy to answer any questions. Does anyone have any questions? Actually, uh, identified a couple of patients with real mutations in the S chat gene, not the uh, polymorphisms. Um, these patients are now probably in their 20s. These are some of the very early real mutations. And they're fine. They've never taken carnitine, they've never been sick. They excrete all the right metabolites all the time, but uh, you know, they're, they're, they're otherwise well. Now, who knows? Uh, they get, as they get older, they're going to develop muscle problems, 
neurological problems and anything like that. We just don't know. Uh, but certainly in terms of acute pediatric disease, I think, yes, uh, I'm not sure what the gain is. But can, can you speculate as to, in the fatty uh, liver, do we know what might be getting across to the mother to cause it? How can this little baby in little placenta cause such a dramatic effect in the mother? Do we know anything about that? We, we don't. Uh, my, my hypothesis is that we are seeing increased um, levels of 3-hydroxy fatty acids and free acids. And I do believe they are the toxic in a detergent-like fashion. Uh, but um, there's, there's no proof that this is actually causing another disease. That's, that's just a uh, hypothesis. Um, mom should theoretically be able to make enough ketone bodies because she's got half the enzyme. And, uh, but you know, when not pregnant uh, with a homozygous fetus, she can do. Uh, so I, I, whether it's just the, you know, the additional burden of a maybe Because this is third trimester science, so the placenta is not so tiny at this point. So there may be a huge metabolic burden. And, um, and I, th I think we do believe now that placenta is not just a conduit for passing uh, energy supplies to the fetus. I think it actually metabolizes itself. So it may just be that, that you know, it's the sheer size of the, the placenta. Could it be sort of immunological, like you see in preeclampsia and Hope syndrome? Like just something to do with the trophoblast invasion being different in a woman with who's had a rhizygous with a homozygous fetus, but it's just something different immunologically about the placenta. It could be. It could well be. I mean, I, I, I just don't have an answer. And another thing, like a lot of times when women get sick at the end of pregnancy, like something like, I mean, you treat them by making them MPO, does that make it worse? <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, that's just the first instinct. They're sick, they're MPO. You know, you might deliver them, they're MPO. Well, I guess in this situation, it it's a very rare situation, of course, so but I'm sure for the majority of women, it's no worse than fasting normally, but certainly, I would imagine if you're heterozygous, LCHAT deficient, carrying fetus, being embryo would not be good. Okay, because a lot of times you just see unexplained, like, just fulminant, I mean, it's not often, but fulminant fatty liver, mm -hmm. acute fatty liver pregnancy, and like, sometimes it's just, I mean, that is a possible explanation, and it would just, like, it, maybe there's a way you can test them and just, Make sure that you at least be done for the IV or whatever. Right. There's also a, a very rare obstetric condition, condition called uh, placental form infarct. Uh, and there's one case of l chart deficiency associated with placental form infarct in the literature. And I can tell you now, we've just done a <coughs> survey uh, of 10 years of placental form infarcts uh, in, a, in a rather large uh, um, obstetric unit, not in the children's hospital. We don't get them in the children's hospital. And every single case has got mutations in the health chat unit. So I think there is, you know, there, there is some obstetric, real obstetric sort of uh, complication going on there in this situation. Do you wonder about the, um, the Inuit variant that you showed us earlier in your talk? Um, have you looked at done like a comparative genome study to look at animals that are are carnivores as opposed to omnivores to see um, if, in fact, there may be um, more common variants among those. Yeah, so the question was related to the Inuit variants and whether we looked at anyone else. But I, I, the reason I showed the picture of the polar bear was not, not uh, because it was a pretty cool picture. Um, <laughs> I, I would imagine anyone who wanted to study the CPT in, in polar bear might find a very similar situation because they have the same lifestyle, basically. Mm -hmm. I just wouldn't want to be the one pouring blood. <laughs> <laughs> so um, patients with urea cycle disorders, when on treatment, tend to have higher glutamine levels, and when they have metabolic crises, the glutamine levels go sky high. Do they show hyperinsulinism in response to elevated glutamine levels? And should we be concerned about that? That's a good question to which I don't know the yeah. answer. I, I just clinically, you know, we have not seen that hypoglycemia associated well, we with it. Well, we put them on glucose on yeah. right away. Yeah, but still, you know, but we haven't looked for insulin levels, so it means something we can. But the, so the, the, the idea about catabolism, you know, we know that most of these patients, um, it was not the, it, it's during the catabolism that they really. Go crazy in terms of uh, 
the symptoms we get from the whole profile as a language that I go for that. That was Brandon's work also, actually, as well. That's what he did in Scotland, but we don't know what it is. When you showed, uh, when you studied the interaction between complement uh, heterogeneous and the uh, SHAT, have you looked to whether how the how they are substrate, uh, how they are latent affect the interaction between these two? So, so it seems like you you looked at the substrate for complement dehydrogenase, but have you looked at uh, whether the substrate for SHAT actually affected right. um, the yeah. bonding? We have done the Congress experiment, mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, the, the GDH a mixing experiment didn't mm -hmm. actually impact S chain at all. Uh, we would have liked to have seen that. So we actually now we can do. We, we know, of course, that um, uh, the, the, the GDH is probably not going to impact S chain activity because of the GDH activated activated mutations don't have signs of S chain deficiency. Uh, so, so um, we're, we're thinking that there are other interactions going on. So, um, so for GDH dehydrogenase um, patient, they usually have hyperammonemia. Mm -hmm. Do we see that in S chat? The one case of S chat deficiency who does not have hyperinsulinism did actually have some hyperammonemia representation, but it was a liver failure picture. So there may be other reasons as well. It would be nice to think, I guess, that this is impacting CPS activity in some way. Mm -hmm. so, so do people know what is the reason for um, hyperammonemia in glutamate dehydrogenase deficiency? Do you think that could be because it's, uh, it's competing for CPS? Yeah, I, I think there's competition for the glutamate to, to make n glutamate for CPS cofactor uh, for transamination. So I think I think the whole the center of this little universe is glutamate and there's competition between the different pathways. I have a question regarding the uh, interactions. Have you shown that interaction using uh, more physiologically relevant conditions like CoIP? And the second question I had is from the large list of proteomic candidates, which one do you go after? Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, th this is all unpublished, out of the press. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 some of the proteins that we pulled down, the defects are well known, and I mean, we understand them, and I guess they become less lighter. It's, we're looking for proteins, I think, that might not be associated with a known disease. What we'd love to have seen, actually, would be a uh, sirtuin or two, and, uh, because we know that these proteins are modified. They're acetylene. And we know that for sure. Uh, and that would be great because that activates, deactivates. But um, maybe this next round of pull downs that we've just done um, may give us some, uh, some more insight. But in the s patients themselves, what does the degree of hyperinsulinemia do, or do we see? Do you know, yeah, Dr. Stanley doesn't believe that you need to show hyperinsulinism to have a diagnosis of hyperinsulinism. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. <laughs> and it's, it's so yeah. but, but he tells me that you know, you, if you've got a, a phenotype that looks right, smells right, it probably is right. Uh, but he did some very extensive sort of uh, fasting investigations of all these patients, and you don't always see uh, hyperinsulinism per se. So you know, because it's clinically you're going to do it, that will not give up. That's exactly why. Yeah. Uh, it's really it's quite a critical draw. You could have to have a, a blood sample whilst hypoglycemia, for instance. So you've got to get that draw while in the ER. Thank you. Thank you.